Welcome to a tutorial about testing code with Hypothesis. Uh, if you're in the wrong room, I will not be offended if you run away. If you decide later that you are in the wrong room, <laughs> I'll be sad but not disappointed. Um, so let, let's start with a bit of an Australian tradition. Uh, at the start of most public events or talks, Australians have what we call an acknowledgement of country, which is a reminder to ourselves that we're meeting on lands that were originally owned in every reasonable sense by indigenous peoples and lands which were subsequently settled and colonized by others in a way that is often deliberately forgotten. So I live in southeastern Australia, down about there, on the lands which traditionally belonged to the Ngunnawal people. And here uh, in Austin, uh, the history is complicated, but from what I've been able to look up, there are a number of tribes, including the Apache, who would traditionally call this area home. So I just wanted to acknowledge that before we moved on. But for this afternoon, uh, we're going to go through a tutorial in about five parts. Uh, first of all, we'll go through the motivation as to why we would actually want to do this stuff. And I just want to ask at SciPy, like, who here has ever tested a hypothesis? Most of us? Yeah, it's not that kind of hypothesis or that kind of testing here. Um, but the idea is that for science, as for so much else of life in the 21st century, computation is becoming really, really important. And unfortunately, sometimes computers, and especially software, have bugs in them. And if we have bugs in our software, we have bugs in our science. Maybe these are harmless, maybe they aren't. Uh, NASA, in a few cases, has accidentally had probes land a little faster than intended. Uh, <laughs> most of our bugs, I hope, are not that expensive and not that embarrassing, but there are tools that we can use to try to do better. So I'm going to cover you know, a little more detail of the motivation, some general tips for writing testable code, that is code where it's easier to work out with these kinds of tools what it's meant to be doing and check whether it's actually doing that. And then we'll go through three kind of hands-on blocks where I'll give a short talk beforehand, and then we'll have 20 to 30 minutes of hands-on coding, testing, playing around with the library, and then come back for another round of talk. Sound good? Awesome. And those will be you know, introduction to property-based testing, describing data, and tactics for running these tests. Just to give me a sense of who I'm talking to, can I just see a show of hands? Like, can everyone put your hands up? <laughs> okay, most of you can put your hands up. That's good to know. So who here would spend most of their time writing kind of data analysis scripts? So maybe working in Jupyter Notebooks more than something like PyCharm? Couple? Awesome. Who here spends most of their time kind of working on shared functionality? So maybe reusable scripts, stuff that would be used by a team at your institution? Quite a lot of people. And who here does a lot of work with kind of big open source libraries which would be used by many people? A couple of those too. Awesome. I'm hoping this will be useful to everyone. Uh, Hypothesis is generally targeted towards people writing Python scripts and modules more than Jupyter Notebooks, but you can use it interactively even there as well. And one of the things I'm really interested in is actually working out how we apply these tools to workflows that would not traditionally write kind of software tests at all. So, software. It turns out that the SciPy community actually does a lot of really important and interesting work with scientific software. So this image comes from a paper, Klein et al. 2017, which was looking at, I honestly do not know enough neurobiology to talk about this, the curvature of the outer surface of the brain, which I understand is important for some reason that I don't understand. And interestingly, this colour map we might recognise, right? It's Verinus. And this is a colour map which was developed by members of our community and debuted at SciPy a couple of years ago. And seeing, seeing our work in the wild always excites me. But my point here is the stuff we do at SciPy and as members of this broader scientific community matters. It actually impacts on people's lives. Getting it right matters, and it's something that I think we can be proud of. So when I talk about the things that go wrong, that any scientific result could be wrong if data have passed through a computer, I don't mean this as a criticism in any sense. I mean it as something we can take as a challenge, but I certainly don't mean to say that I am perfect and never write bugs, because that would be a complete lie, but rather that we know that this is hard. We know that everyone is doing their best, but we want better tools, better ways to work out what our code is actually doing, because computers are like the kind of genie where they do exactly what you told them, not what you wanted them to do. 
And unfortunately for computers, they also might not be doing what you thought you told them to do. They'll do what you actually told them to do via the stack of however many dependencies we're all working on these days. And so code, both the libraries and the kind of one-off data analysis is critical for scientific work. And yet, we're not always sure what our code does. We generally have a pretty good idea of what it should be doing, but in the case of simulations, we don't even know what the correct output is. We may not even, in the case of weather models, know what the correct input is, and we still have to do something with this anyway. So what can we do? Step number one is actually just writing code which is easier to test and easier to grasp what it's meant to be doing, so testable code. This bit is unsexy, but crucially important. It might actually be the most useful thing you take away from today. So there are a number of things that you can do to design for testability. And I'll literally just go through these in order. The first is deterministic behavior. Any source of randomness makes it much harder to work out if the code is doing what it should do, because you don't know exactly what it should be doing. It would depend on the internal random state. So whenever you're using some code that needs to behave randomly, if it's going to be a reusable thing, I like to make sure there's a seed argument that I can pass in. So I know if I call the same functions with the same arguments, I will always get the same result. Not kind of a similar result, but exactly the same one. I like to make sure that data is immutable, so I can't accidentally overwrite it when I'm nearly finished. That one has happened a few times. Canonical data is the idea that for any given state, there should be exactly one way to represent it. So you don't need complicated functions that check for equivalence, you can literally just use equality. Separating your I.O. from your logic, that is your loading from disk or your grabbing stuff over the network from the actual computation, again makes things easier to test and it really helps isolate those functions. Make sure that the complicated part of your code is something that you can call with the same arguments, get the same results. Functional programmers love this idea and I don't think we need to take it as far as Haskell, but the basic idea can be useful even if you just have a little. But the single quickest one is assertions. Like who here has used assertions in their code? Wow, this is way more than SciPy, than PyCon. So an assertion is a statement in Python, but an assertion more broadly is a thing in a program which is always true unless there is a bug. And that bug might be that someone called the function with the wrong arguments, which it wasn't meant to support. An assertion means you find out when you call it not when reviewer two comes back and asks what your results look like. And always true unless there is a bug means that you can turn up things that you didn't realize at the time. When some other part of the system changes or one of your colleagues assumes that a function with a very clear and sensible name does what they understand it to mean instead of what you understood it to mean, an assertion means that gets caught at the source. So it makes local reasoning much easier and tends to catch a lot of problems before they make it out of that function. So I like to sprinkle them through everywhere. The best bit is if you run with the environmental variable Python optimize equals one, the assertions don't even execute. So they're super, super fast and you get that extra safety checking when you're not in a performance critical area. A test function, there are lots of different ways of thinking about what a test should do. Uh, they have catchy little mnemonics like arrange, act, assert, or given, when, then. But a crucial thing is that a test ideally will fail if there is a bug, and it will not fail if there is not a bug. Both of these are ideals. Some tests fail when there are no bugs just because it's Monday or Tuesday. There are infamous bugs where printers work on every day of the week except Tuesday. Uh, it, it turned out that the string choose near the start of a postscript file meant it was interpreted as an image and then the printer literally physically locked up. Um, that one, I understand, was a lot of fun for people to debug over the course of months because, of course, you can only reproduce it on Tuesdays. <laughs> <laughs> you would have posted the issue tracker and everyone would go, it, it works for me, and they'd come back and go, well, it works for me as well. I'm sorry, guys. And then next Tuesday. <laughs> but on the other side of things, sometimes it's okay for a test that only sometimes fails if the bug is present, or fails for some subset of possible bugs but not others. What we're after here is really confidence building. It's not a formal mathematical proof that our code is correct, but more a kind of preparing approach to falsifying our own beliefs about our code by an automated experiment. 
And so traditionally, we do what I call auto-manual tests, or completely manual tests even, where a human, like you or I, will decide what input to feed into a function, you know, write this out as a function in Python code, run the operation, and compare the results to what was expected. And this works really well, but I'll be honest, it's pretty tedious. Like, has anyone done this? Did you all enjoy it? Find it uplifting? <laughs> Exciting? Like, you're like, I can't wait to get to work today and write a lot of test cases. Um, so doing this in code is nice because it means you only have to write them once and then you can just like python my script.py and it'll execute it and it'll be repeatable. So you can come back a year later having forgotten what it was meant to do and still run the tests. But I wouldn't call it completely automated given that there's so much human labor still involved. So there are some other kinds of tests that people use. Uh, there are diff tests, which is where you run the same operation using different software or different versions and check that you get the expected output again. So this is really common with simulations. If you upgrade it, you reproduce the results of the previous run just to check that you haven't broken anything. You have doc tests, where you actually embed example code, you know, input and output sessions in your documentation or your doc strings and can then execute it to demonstrate that the function does what you think it should do. You have coverage tests which use the coverage tool to work out which parts of your code were not executed. Has anyone used coverage? About half? I really like this because if I haven't executed code, I know I haven't tested it. If I have executed it, I may have tested it, depending. But if it's not even executed, it's certainly not tested. And if you're running something performance critical, sometimes I actually run coverage on my data analysis code while crunching data. And if I have branches or lines which are not even executed, I just delete them and hope for it speed up. But my, my caveat on this is the default is to use the percentage coverage. I actually find this a really unhelpful metric. Because if you delete some trivially covered but pointless code, the metric goes down. And I tend to think that the number you use should actually be monotonic. That if it goes up, that should be better. And if it goes down, it should be worse. And it should not be like, oh, we lost about half a percent, but I think it's fine. Right? So you can use the number of uncovered lines, or even better, an annotated view which shows you which parts of your code were not executed. And that can be a really helpful tool. And so what we're going to be talking about today, finally, is called property-based testing. And so here, instead of a human choosing a particular input or bit of data, we describe what kind of data should be valid. And that might be a floating point number, or a string, or an array or a data frame, for example. And then we write a test which should pass for any valid input. You know, I can sort any list. I can take the maximum of the column of any such data frame. And then you hand it over to an engine like Hypothesis, which will then generate many test cases, you know, a few hundred pseudo-random examples, run your test on each of them, and then if it found an error, it will do some black magic and give you a minimal counterexample to your assertions. And that minimization step is actually really important for usability. Uh, it is far, far easier to debug a problem when you get the example, if I give you a list and the list is one, zero, your sorting function does nothing. Then if you get the original failure, which might have been a list of 30 something elements of all kinds, you go, well, how am I meant to know what part of this causes a problem? But if you see one, zero goes in, one, zero comes out, you're like, yeah, that doesn't look like it's changing anything. So, property-based testing. I've got the wrong cartoon here. Um, we're we're going to do the version of this where you have a library, right? So it looks more like that. This one's my version. That one's your version. Sound good? So with Hypothesis, a property-based test looks something like this. You import the given decorator and you import strategies for describing data generation. Then you say, given, with the at given decorator, in this case, lists of at least one integer. And this can generate any list full of any such numbers. Run this function to, talk, to test my uh, dubious sorting function. Put it together pretty late last night. Uh, so the simple version is we can just confirm that it does exactly the same thing as a trusted version. And often this will come from previous work that you've done. It might be that you have the single-threaded version, which you were confident in, before you had to make it go faster by multi-threading. Or it might be that you have the version from a previous paper, which you're trying to extend. You can go, for anything that I put into this, they should do the same thing. Or in some cases, 
we might not actually be sure how to implement a sorting function, but we know what a sorted list looks like. And so in this case, a sorted list has the same number of each element, and the elements of the output pairwise are in order, right? Earlier elements are always less than or equal to later elements. And so we can actually check if the list has been sorted without knowing how to sort a list, which becomes very important when we're doing more complicated things than list sorting, simulations, agent-based modeling, or whatever else we're doing. And so with that, we're going to go hands-on for the first time. Most of this tutorial will actually be hands-on. I and a few helpers will be walking around to give you a hand with anything. So, fire up a terminal, run PyTest, and then jump into your preferred text editor and follow the comments. All right. So, 10 to 3, we're back. How did people go with block 1? <coughs> Used hypothesis? Made some tests fail? Made some tests pass? Excellent. Uh, so block two is about going into a little more detail about how we describe data with hypothesis. That strategies module that you've all gotten hands on with now. So as we all know, the hypothesis.strategies module is how we describe inputs that the given decorator can then generate for us. Uh, the caveat here is you should only construct strategies via the public API. There's a type provided, but use it for type hints, but not for other things. Uh, we think this is a nice API too, so you should enjoy using it more than trying to do custom things. Most strategies and the simplest strategies are for values of some kind, whether that's integers or date times or strings. Basically, if it's built into Python and for most things in the standard library, you can build it with things in the strategies module. Uh, unlike some other property-based testing libraries, uh, values are not just generated as being of a particular type. You can also choose limits of them. So you guys will have seen how to limit the minimum and maximum value from the integers strategy, size of lists. For some things like floating point numbers, we have additional arguments. So for floats, you don't just get to choose the minimum and maximum. You can also say any finite float. So exclude infin infinite numbers or exclude not a number. Because who would want to deal with not a number, really? <laughs> And then for times, you can choose to pass a time zone strategy if you really want to make your day worse. You can also generate collections. So we, we played with the list strategy. There's also sets, dicts, one for iterable things, which are not sequences. And these all take a strategy for the elements, which you will have seen, and then optionally a minimum and maximum size. And so you compose the values strategy for elements along with the collection strategy to get the data that you're going to build. And every strategy, whether it's for a value, a collection, or something else, has these two handy methods if you want to transform it in some way. So map, the map method takes a function, whether it's a lambda or some other function, and applies that function to whatever example came from the inner strategy, and then returns a strategy which generates the inner thing, applies the function, and gives you that instead. So if you took integers, dot map, multiply by two, so lambda x, x times 2, you will have a strategy for even numbers only, which will shrink in the same way. Or you could filter to discard any numbers which are not even. This is inefficient, though. If you can, prefer using the map method to the filter method. The alternative, basically, is you tell the engine, like, give me a thing. No, I don't want it. Give me a thing. I don't want that one. You're better off just going, yeah, I can deal with this thing. So filter occasionally, though, is just indispensable. So don't be shy about using it when you need it. But do just think to yourself, can I do this with a map instead? If you've got more complicated requirements, so you don't want particular integers, for example, but you have a list of values, any of which should be allowed, there's a sampled from strategy, which is literally given a list or a tuple or whatever else. Give me elements from it. Or there's permutations to go give me the elements of this list in any order. There are a couple of different ways to define recursive data. Did anyone make it through the JSON example that was the last one in that file? A couple of people? Yeah, lists of NANDs are awful. Um, for those who haven't tried it, um, there is a fun effect with Python's equality semantics. So not a number is a special floating point value which is not equal to itself. And a thing that's not equal to itself is nasty in Python's object model, but that's how floats work. Uh, but then if you put one in a list, so you have a single element list which has nan in it, Python will just do the fast path. It will be like, 
is this list the same by identity? And so we'll go, yes, it's the same list. It's equal. And then when you put that to JSON and then back, it goes, hmm, these lists are not equal. Let me compare their first elements. And it's like, oh, they're not equal. So you have a list which is equal to itself until you round trip it, at which point it's not. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. The recursive strategies do generate stuff, though. Um, you can combine strategies. So in general, you can take the union of strategies, but not the intersection, because in the general case, that's just awful. Um, so for example, integers and then the pipe for bitwise or, this will give you a strategy which can generate integers or text. And the minimal example from this strategy of integers or text will be the number zero. If you had it the other way around, the minimal example would be the empty string, because it prefers to generate whatever is furthest to the left. Make sense? Cool. And finally, we have a strategy called builds, which takes as its first argument like a class or a function, and then as subsequent positional or keyword arguments, strategies corresponding to the positional and keyword arguments of that function. So if you have some custom data type or custom function you want to call, you can pass it to builds and then get the result from that. It's pretty cool. The final trick which I really love is inferring strategies. Like if you don't want to write out what kind of data is valid, often you have some schema, like a programmatic way to detect whether or not something is valid. And in many cases, Hypothesis can inspect that and automatically give you a strategy for things which pass that validator. One of my personal favorites is regular expressions. So there's a from regex strategy, you pass it a pattern, and then it generates strings which match that regular expression. This one is pretty cool. And if you look at the examples, this is start of string, any capital letter from ASCII, then one or more word characters, and then the end of the string. And so this might look like pretty standard ASCII, though complete gibberish, or it might go, there are these higher Unicode code points, which are still word characters, right? Uh, more relevant to SciPy than probably anyone else, there is a from dtype function in the numpy extra, which will give you a strategy for scalars or mini arrows or whatever else, which are instances of that data type. So in this case, it's a triplet of four byte floats, and sure enough, that's what it generates. And I mentioned builds earlier. Builds actually can, if you're using Python 3, inspect any type annotations that you have on your function and automatically work out what arguments it needs to call it successfully. That one's a lot of fun. And so in this case, you don't even need to tell it what to pass for the argument A. It can just work out that it needs integers. It knows how to generate integers, and then it'll call the function f and give you the return value. So if you need stuff beyond the standard library, whether that's in NumPy, Pandas, or a number of other places, we ship with a number of those. And there are many more third-party extensions that you can grab off PyPI. If you have data which depends on other inputs to the test, so again, many of these examples are kind of synthetic. They're, they're simple so that they fit on a single slide, but they're not representative of what you'll do in the real world. The idea is you see what the functions do and get an idea of where to look when you need them. But if you want, for example, a string and then an index into the string, and let's be honest, you probably won't have string in that sentence, it'll be something like an array, you can use the composite decorator to turn an arbitrary function that you write into a strategy definition. And what that does is it gives you a magic first argument that we call draw by convention, which can get you an example out of any other strategy in a way that will work. And then you simply do whatever logic you wish. You can then include earlier draws in the arguments to later ones and return that. Or when all else fails, there's the data strategy, which gives you that magic object as an argument to your test. So you can actually mix your test logic with your data generation logic. <coughs> this one is incredibly powerful. The catch is when it fails or if it fails, debugging it tends to be a bit nastier because we can't print simply what the arguments to your test function were. Make sense? All right. So you may have noticed as you were going through that what you tended to see was minimal counterexamples. So fairly short strings, lists of just one or two numbers, and they tended to be zero or one. That's not what was originally found. That's what happens after Hypothesis had minimized the example. 
And so strategies shrink from the inside out. If you take integers and then map and multiply, what shrinks is the inner strategy. It then gets piped through the rest, but what the engine sees is that underlying level. Collections will shrink towards the smallest collection with the fewest elements. Numbers tend to shrink towards zero. Things tend to shrink towards earlier characters in the alphabet, that kind of thing. There's not a kind of mathematical definition, though there is a defined total ordering. But the exact order of minimization is based on heuristics that the hypothesis developers think will be broadly useful. So if you come across something where it's minimized and it really doesn't seem minimal, let us know and we'll see if we can help you debug it. And finally, this means that when we're running multiple tests, it's possible that we see different errors. Like if we see a value error and a type error, we'll actually report both of them at once. So running a test function a single time with Hypothesis can give you multiple bug reports in one go, which I think is pretty cool. I mentioned inline data before. It looks pretty familiar from the composite definition, right? So, I had a couple of people already ask me, like, this stuff is cool, but what do I do with it? Like, what test do I write once I'm beyond these toy examples? So let's talk about some testing tactics as distinct from hypothesis strategies. The first one is just, if you're doing the kind of traditional testing, your strategy, your tactic is simple. You check that the actual output is equal to the expected output. If you're generating stuff with hypothesis, you probably can't do that. So the next best one is to use what we call an oracle test, like a full specification where your function is correct if it behaves identically to some trusted version. This can be, in our sorting example, the Python sorted built-in. We just trust that Python got that one right. Uh, for us, often it can be useful to use a SciPy or a NumPy implementation of some complicated function. Uh, this is great if you have such an oracle, which is not as rare as you might think. You might have a multi-threaded and a single-threaded version, and you can check that they behave identically, which at the very least checks that your threading logic has no bugs in it, because when would it ever have bugs in it? Partial specifications can also be useful. If you're dealing with probabilities, for example, you can assert that they're always between zero and one. It doesn't no demonstrate that you definitely have the correct answer, but there are at least some wrong answers that that would detect, which is a lot better than nothing. And a little later, we're gonna talk about metamorphic testing and hyperproperties, which are like my favorite words uh, invented by people who really needed good paper titles. <laughs> So oracles are fantastic if you're refactoring things or trying to put in some performance optimizations because you have a natural thing to compare to. It's the version before you started messing around with the guts of it. Uh, the other really neat technique is what I call a reverse oracle, which is where you generate the correct answer and then you calculate some input that should lead to that output. It's not a universal trick, but sometimes going backwards in that way is actually easier. Uh, unfortunately, if you come up with a complicated oracle, you may need to test your oracle that you use to test your other thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sometimes it helps anyway. For partial specification, you don't actually need to know an exact answer to detect some errors. You know, for any group of numbers, the minimum should be less than or equal to the mean, which is less than or equal to the maximum. And you should also probably be able to tell that if the mean is equal to the minimum, then it is also equal to the maximum. If you want to try this with floating point numbers, you will discover things that you didn't want to know. But importantly, there are a lot of specifications for saving and loading data that actually take this form. We can go, I don't know exactly how this thing should be represented on disk, but I do know that if I save it to disk and then I read it back, I should have the same data frame at the end of it. Or I do know that if I write it to disk, read it back and then write that to disk, the two files I have on disk should be bitwise identical. Again, you will probably discover things about like timestamps and all kinds of things that you really didn't want to know. But I, I kind of like finding out things I didn't know when I find it out when I'm testing deliberately rather than when review of two finally gets back to me. Oracles can also be useful when they don't cover all of the domain. So one of the tests that we were looking at was how do you get lists where the sum is always greater than the maximum? And someone pointed out to me that what we ended up with there, you know, lists of at least two elements, each of which is at least one, doesn't actually include all possible lists for which this is true. You know, some lists with zeros or negative numbers in them still pass that test. But it can still be useful to test even on only part of the domain 
Again, we're not saying we'll catch all bugs, but rather that we're going to catch at least some bugs. Um, sometimes you can use a general oracle for your entire domain and then a more specific one. So you know something additional about what should happen when your function is monotonic or continuous or when all inputs are positive or when all inputs are zero, that kind of thing. Even just varying a single parameter so that it's easy to calculate what to expect. Uh, the last bit is there are a bunch of properties which are shared by a lot of code. Sometimes they're just good API design. Other times they're a pain in the ass, but it's really worth it to get that extra test power. My personal favorite remains, when I call my function with valid input, it does not crash. This is embarrassingly effective. This function on the screen fails. Anyone want to tell me why? Empty list. Divide by zero. Empty list issues. There's an enormous number of ways for a function to crash when you pass it inputs that you thought were valid. Another one that can be useful is invariance. So if you shuffle your input data, there are many functions where shuffling the input should not affect the output, and you can test that. There are others where if you repeat the function, it's idempotent and it shouldn't change again. So taking the unique part of some list, for example. Round trip tests are honestly my favorite kind because they are so widely useful and there is so much complexity that goes into saving and loading so many data formats these days. So the first test I would use to write with hypothesis on a new code base would be this one. Does it crash? My second would be, can I save and load my data? And is it still my data at the end of that? That's a high value test as well, right? Most, most of us, I assume, work with some data of some form and we would like to be able to work with the same data tomorrow. So it's a useful thing to test. Uh, so back to a hands-on block. I'll be coming around and happy to take any questions. Same plan as last time. This time we're looking at the strategies and tactics file. Open it, run it, edit it, retest it. Has anyone made it to the end of the test file and run out of things to do? Wow, you guys are fast. Let's move to block three then. And I'll say if you manage to finish this one, I will be very impressed. And I also have another file of like tough bonus problems, which will definitely get you stuck for the rest of the time. So at, at the end of the last block, I mentioned my two favorite headings, metamorphic testing and hyper properties. Right? And so these are techniques or tactics for testing particularly complex kind of codes. So particularly, how do you test a black box? How do you test a simulation or a model where you're doing research and you literally don't know what the correct answer should be because you're writing the code to find out? One answer is metamorphic testing. So a metamorphic relation is what comes up where we actually don't know the correct relationship between input and output but we do know or could know something about the relationship between two corresponding input-output pairs. For example, we might not know how something maps you know, through a linear transform, but we do know that if we double our vector of inputs, we expect to double our vector of outputs, even though we might not know what the corresponding output is for any input. Make sense? When you generalize this, it becomes incredibly powerful. So I'll walk you through a couple of examples. This technique is actually really popular for compilers. If you have a C compiler, given any you know, valid C source file without undefined behavior, which is a lot of caveats, but it is C, no matter which compiler you use to compile that program, the resulting executable should exhibit the same behavior. And so you can then actually test a group of compilers or a group of implementations of something by running them all in parallel and looking for outputs that don't match with the rest of the group. And you might not be able to tell which one of them the bug is in, but you do know that there's a bug somewhere. If it's a thing which is meant to have well-defined, well-specified behavior. So it's a kind of differential testing. 
Uh, you can use this to test implementations from other languages, from other libraries, from your colleagues, from that paper where you get to be reviewer too for a change. Neural networks are kind of the ultimate black box. By design, they're kind of a, a stack of so many parameters we can fit to a problem that we can fit problems we literally can't even describe yet. Um, but when we look at this, testing neural networks, particularly testing trained models for errors, is pretty rare. Uh, to be honest, I'm scared of the state of the art of testing for neural networks. And so if you're working on this kind of model, I'd have a couple of tips. One is just try to think of all the assertions that you could embed at a local level, that when you do a single training step, the model weights should change, and preferably the losses should decrease. That when you shuffle a batch and then run it different times, you should get the same model weight changes no matter how you shuffle the inputs to that batch. There's a lot of little properties which don't guarantee that the behavior is correct, but do catch a lot of subtle errors which come up in practice, like connecting the wrong layers of the network, or connecting a layer twice, or leaving a layer out. And so if you can catch those more quickly than after your you know, 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. debugging session, that, that's nice to have. You can also test that your inputs and outputs are appropriately bounded, that your thing really does converge eventually, and so on. Um, Computer vision is another one. This is an incredibly complex domain, mapping video to objects, for example. Uh, but we can state a couple of properties, at least informally, like a self-driving car should not confidently choose a completely different course of action if there is a speck of dust on the camera lens, or a couple of raindrops, or if the camera is rotated by two and a half degrees, or if there's light fog. Um, if you go to this link, people have done those tests and I, for one, am very glad that there are none of these things on the road in my hometown. So, for the last set of exercises, uh, in the scientific hypothesis file, we have some round trip tests, saving and loading a NumPy array and a pandas data frame. And in testing the untestable, I have some simple examples of metamorphic tests that you can try to apply, and also some examples of what we call stateful testing, where you can actually evolve a system over multiple time steps and assert properties over that. Um, that one's pretty cool if less immediately of applicable to the data analysis that many of us do. So if you're interested, go for it. Otherwise, stick to the others. If you run through all of those, for the remainder of the time, I'd love it if you want to try applying hypothesis to some of your own code. I'll be around and I can help out. I'll talk to you about that. Um, and then at the end, we'll come back together for a final 10 or 15 minutes of talking. Sound good? Awesome. So, I'll be back in a moment, right? Um, so it's coming up to five o'clock and we're going to be wrapping up fairly soon. So I thought I'd give you guys just the last kind of snippet of overview, which is around like how to make hypothesis go fast. How, how to make hypothesis go fast, how to configure things like how many examples it runs or where it caches its data, and of course, like how you can get involved and what the little pins that you found on your table mean. Uh, so the first one is like, how do you tell what it's actually doing if a test is passing? Uh, you can pass the show statistics argument, which will tell it to print out things about how many examples it ran, what they did, how long each of them took, a kind of breakdown of the performance profile. Um, and there's a function, hypothesis.event, that you can call to add custom statistics. Um, that one can be useful. If you like print debugging, uh, I believe there's nothing wrong with that. And if you like print debugging where it doesn't show you the 600 earlier examples that it ran, note is exactly like print, except it only actually outputs stuff on the final example. So it's, it's like print debugging, but more so. Um, 
In terms of how to make hypothesis generate data really quickly, uh, to be honest, this is pretty obvious. If you call slow things, it's slower. If you call more things, that takes longer. If you generate more data, that also takes longer. And if you filter more, that is reject a higher proportion of your data, that takes longer too. Otherwise, things should be fast. Like, there are, in general, no kind of weird pathological performance corners because when we notice those, we fix them. So if you do notice one, open an issue and we'll fix it. Uh, if you notice things are shrinking li really slowly, so when Hypothesis finds an error, it takes a really long time to show you a minimal example, uh, there are a couple of things to know. The first is how shrinking composes. So the engine sees it from the bottom up. So it'll see any strategy before it has filters or maps or composites applied. And a composite strategy basically looks like sequentially drawing each thing in it as far as the engine is concerned. So you want to design your composite strategies or your collections so that if any small part of it shrinks, if a single draw shrinks, the overall effect is to shrink the input to the test. So, you know, if you're drawing collections, you should use the collections API. But if you did something pathological, like you draw a number and then you draw that many things, you definitely want to do it that way. Instead of drawing a number, subtracting it from 100 and then drawing that many things. Because when we minimize the original number, your collection gets bigger and everything is bad. You want to keep things as local as possible. So filters or the assume function should be as close to where the data is generated by the engine as possible. And that way, for example, it can retry the drawing individual elements of a list rather than having to retry drawing the entire list with all of its elements. Um, do avoid drawing a size in that many things. The collections functions have min size and max size parameters that you can use instead. Uh, but also remember that the whole point of doing this stuff is to not waste your time. So don't spend more time optimizing test code than you will actually spend waiting for test code. Um, for configuration, there's the hypothesis.settings module. This one's pretty straightforward. You can read the docs to see what's available, including the number of examples it runs by default, what database to use to cache failing examples, you know, a deadline for each test, so you can configure the timeout. You can look that up. Uh, report multiple bugs is kind of fun. If Hypothesis finds multiple bugs in a single run, it will individually report all of them. But if you want to drop into it in a debugger, you actually want it to give you a single bug at a time. So you might want to turn that off. Uh, and you can set this per test using a decorator, or you can actually set it for the entire test suite. So you can load a profile. And because it's done in code, you can even have the profile it loads depend on environment variable, for example. So it can be really easy to switch between the fast profile and the I really want to test this thoroughly profile. Hypothesis tests should not be flaky. Uh, some of you might have seen like an error that Hypothesis raises, which is literally named flaky, where it detected some tests that behaved differently when it ran it twice with exactly the same inputs. We do consider that a bug because it tends to break all of the ideas about shrinking things if the bug might or might not happen when we run it this function with particular arguments. Uh, so to do that, we cache any failing inputs and replay them again and again until the bug is fixed. And then we actually keep them around forever as well and replay just a small number of them each time to make sure that historical bugs haven't come back. Um, so on your local machine, it's completely automatic. If you run it in CI, as we do, uh, it'll print a seed or it'll print a decorator that you can use to reproduce it locally. Then it's in your local cache and everything is good. Um, lots of people use really old versions of dependencies. You can do that with Hypothesis, but you won't get all the shiny new stuff. And the shiny new stuff is sometimes really, really cool. Um, so we release every pull request within about 30 minutes of it being merged because our release process is entirely automated. So you never have that kind of thing where you go to the issue tracker and you file a bug and you get told that it was fixed but hasn't been released yet because I know I don't like that. Um, so bug fixes are available within about half an hour of merging as are uh, everything else. Um, but you can trust the new releases because Hypothesis is exceedingly well tested. <laughs> right? Uh, so do stay up to date, just, you know, for your own sake. This, this is for your benefit, not for mine. Um, as to who else uses Hypothesis, uh, I'm kind of torn between thinking it can't be many people and then these kinds of statistics. So the PSF did their survey earlier this year 
and about 4% of everyone who responded uses Hypothesis. So you guys are joining a very cool club. Uh, there are a bunch of companies, most of whom don't tell us anything. Uh, and according to GitHub, about 2,000 open source repos are using a Hypothesis in some way. Um, I should notice here, note here as well that this little badge that you've all gotten is for people who have come to one of these workshops or who've made a contribution to Hypothesis or with Hypothesis at a sprint. So I hope you guys will keep them and be proud of them because it makes you members of a fairly exclusive club. Uh, it being a conference, I guess I have to say, like, if you want cool stuff related to Hypothesis, I am one of the people you can pay to get cool stuff related to Hypothesis. Um, so there we are. Uh, and then final stuff. Uh, we're under the Mozilla public license version 2.0, which basically means you can use it with stuff that does not need to be open sourced, but if you modify Hypothesis itself, that has to be open source. Uh, we welcome new contributors, but note that most of the things on our issue tracker are quite scary. So while Hypothesis will be part of the sprints, what we'll be sprinting on is actually adding tests that use Hypothesis to the other projects that are at SciPy this year. <laughs> uh, I know that some of the NumPy devs are actually really excited to test NumPy more heavily with Hypothesis. Uh, I would like to do that to Pandas as well and SymPy. SymPy would be great because mathematics is well-defined and you know what it should do. Uh, and there are usually multiple ways to express the same thing, so that could be fun. Um, and then the last thing is we really want Hypothesis to be what we call legible. That is, that it's the kind of project where you can understand what it's doing and why. So if you do something unusual, hopefully the API, or at any rate the error messages, should help you understand not just what went wrong, but hopefully why it went wrong and what you can do instead. Uh, so with that, I am at the end of my prepared slides. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions now, or we can keep circulating, keep hacking on stuff until we have to finish up the tutorial. So thank you.